Welcome everyone to Coaching the Session. My name is Michael Reardon and I'll be your mindset coach today. And today we're going to be talking about sports psychology for young minds. And it's important for us to understand that sports psychology is not going to be dealing with, oh, I'm a coach and I'm coaching your kids to be the best basketball player in the world or the best soccer player in the world. We are going to be looking at the psychology of the brain. And I had many guests on who are licensed psychologists who are going to be talking about how the mind is formulated, what the mind is saying. And I'm a big believer in understanding psychology and understanding development. I have studied both extensively. I first started with psychology, then I went into child development, then I went into adult psychology. And I have studied countless amounts of articles and books and trying to get the best understanding I can about the human brain. Because once I understood what the majority of people think or how they operate, I was able to understand the cause and effect of what people might do. So that means if someone is thinking this way, the probability that they're going to do this is going to be this. From there, I was able to help so many adults, teens understand what they should be doing. And I could say it in a way that they would understand because anyone can be a mindset coach. Anyone can be a life coach and just say, all right, we can motivate you and we can cheer you on. And I have to do my diligence when I have my guests on here and coaching a session to validate their work to validate their mission, to validate their cause. Because there's going to be people who just want to be a life coach because it's easy or because maybe it makes a lot of money. But at the same time, are you willing to help people out? Are you willing to make a difference? And sometimes people are just in it for the money. And I know for what I do and what the company does is more than just the money. It's how can we help change the world? And if we can do it one person at a time, we can do it a group at a time, we can do it at a classroom at a time, school at a time, it doesn't necessarily matter how we do it. It's just that we're planting the seeds that these young children need. And it doesn't matter what age, you can be in your 20s and I can plant a seed that might sprout in a couple years and might sprout maybe in 10 years. It doesn't necessarily have a time stamp on when that seed is going to sprout, but what I can tell you is that the seed sprouts for different reasons. So if you're going to have a life that's filled with negative and always worrying about the negative and focusing on the negativities, it's going to be hard for that seed to sprout because you're not taking care of it. You're not watering it. You're not nurturing it. You're not giving it what it needs. And psychology is understanding the human brain, understanding what humans want, and then going in accordance to that. Because when we look at our young minds, our children, our teens, our young adults, We are giving them the life that we never had, especially parents. They're under this belief of, I want to give my kid the life I never had. So they're easy on them. They're soft on them. They take away their responsibilities, the hardships, when in reality, those hardships make them who they are. They make them better. So how can we make sure our young minds, our young athletes especially, are better, that they push themselves and that they don't quit at the first signs of hardship or struggle? Well, I'm going to be bringing on Mike Huber, who's going to be talking about his work as a sports psychology coach, and then us having a conversation of where society is and where young minds are today, and how he can help change your family's trajectory and where they're going and where they'll end up. So let's get into the interview with Mike Huber and myself. Welcome, Michael Huber, to Coaching in Session. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much for coming on. So today I have you on as a sports psychology coach for young athletes and our young adults today, they need good mentors, positive mindsets. And I think the work you do is so amazing. I'm sure when people see sports psychology, they might think of like a football coach or a basketball coach, but I think it's a little bit different. In your own words, can you explain the work you do and how you help? So I work with young athletes, primarily high school and college, to help them use their minds work for them rather than against them, right? So teaching them mental and emotional strategies for managing the many challenges that come with being an athlete today, which is highly pressurized, highly professionalized. And I think, you know, the missing link, and you alluded to this into the intro of the question is, I think I serve as a gateway, right, between the family and the player and the coach, because I think a lot of times there's a lot of emphasis on the technical, tactical, physical, and there's a lot of investment in that. But there's sort of this missing piece of how do we get the most out of the young person, but also protect them as a young person, first and foremost, and put them ahead of just being an athlete, right? So that's sort of my role to give them an outlet and to help them to create some space for 
making sense of the experience that they have. You said protect them as a young person. What does that mean? I think it's giving them the opportunity to advocate for themselves. I think a lot of times, I think this is, I don't want this to come off the wrong way, but I'm just going to use the word because I think it resonates. It's like sometimes they become a pawn in the process. You know, you've got adults around them that are dictating a coach who wants something out of them from a performance perspective to satisfy some objective or need. You've got parents who obviously love and care for their children 99.999% of the time. But I think there's sort of a blind spot for some parents. And so for me, my job is to help them say, hey, listen, I'm here, right? I'm in this. This is it. And when something's not going their way, rather than sort of deferring to the adult or shying away from it, giving them the tools to step up and advocate for themselves, whether it's actively or even passively, like, hey, I know this stuff around me is out of my control. I can't really get these adults to do things differently, but I have the wherewithal, the means to manage that from a mental and emotional standpoint. So it doesn't become overwhelming or it doesn't become debilitating to them a lot of times. So that's, I think my role in the process is to help them advocate for themselves. When you were younger, whether you played sports or not, and then comparing yourself today, if you were, you know, the age of these young athletes, what would you say is maybe the biggest difference? Because you said advocating. For me, I know when I look back at when I was younger versus today, because I was a teacher, so, I, so I'm very aware of these young athletes that are growing up. I work with a lot of young minds, whether it be in high school or college, where I'm helping them understand their mindsets. And I can tell you that the mindset that I had when I was younger is very different than the mindsets that I'm working with today. Can you explain the difference between the mindset that you had growing up versus the mindsets that you see today? Listen, the reason why I got into this field, I was an athlete. I played multiple sports and sports were sort of the center of my universe when I was an adolescent. I think the big part of the reason why I got into it is because I didn't have the wherewithal mentally and emotionally to deal with the stress. And I internalized a lot of things, but my parents didn't really have resources, whether they were emotional or financial to give me the things that I probably needed. So I took on a lot of the burden myself. I think the beauty of where we're at in the world today is there's so much more information and there's so much more awareness in terms of knowing that there are people out there beyond the nuclear family and beyond just a sport coach who can help them. And I think young people do understand that. And frankly, I think they're better at advocating for themselves today than they were 30 years ago when I was an athlete. Certainly if I compare it to myself, I internalized, took everything on myself. I don't think that happens as much today. But I still think ultimately there's a fundamental, and I think it's developmental in a lot of ways. When you're a 14, 15, 17 year old adolescent, right, you're still not sure of yourself in many cases. You lack the confidence or you're not willing to challenge authority. So you wear a lot of this stuff internally. I think the biggest difference though is the information is there. I think the information and the awareness are there, like podcasts like yours, the internet, (laughs) obviously, social media. Right. And I think there's also a balance, right? Some, some, there might be too much information, right? I think to go back to your original question, I do think I play a role in terms of disseminating between like everything that's out there about sport and the mental side of sport, and then really boiling it down to this is what's important, right? This is what's important. And what might be important for Johnny might be not as important for Mary, right? So the way I work in my practices is looking at the person first and really focusing on the human side of it. Like, who are you? What do you want, right? Not just a piece in this very professionalized puzzle or like, I care about you first. You tell me what you need so I can help give it to you, right? In a very personalized way. And then the last question before we can really dive into like the nitty gritty of the conversation is, is there a difference between working with men and women, like young minds of men and young minds of women? I think there is a difference. I think just biologically speaking, I think they're just different beings, right? In most cases. Now, the vast majority of my clients are male for whatever reason. I do have female clients and they are very different. I think there's a a greater awareness of emotions, like they understand their emotions better. They're more willing to accept help in terms of being open-minded about, hey, this person's here to help me. Like I'm going to take these suggestions and do something with them versus with males. It's kind of hit or miss, right? Like a lot of times I think the male either is reluctant to embrace help, or there's sort of just a little bit more ego in the equation. That being said, I think people are people. 
and young people are people. Everybody's the same at the core, which is to say, like my philosophy personally is, and this is not, this is borrowed, is if they know that I care about them as a person first, they're much more likely to open up to the ideas and suggestions and teachings that I have rather than coming at them with this, hey, you need to know this or I'm the authority figure and you need to listen to me. And I think they get so much of that in their life that having an adult that sort of takes the opposite approach of letting them lead the way, it's uncomfortable at first. It can be very freeing and it can sort of unlock a lot of of their potential because they're not used to it. I have two quotes that I want to kind of break down today. The first quote is a quote from Kobe. Basically, he was talking to someone and he was saying that, you know, I'm going to put all my eggs in one basket, right? And then everyone's like, oh, you're not supposed to do that, right? We're learned to not put our, all of our eggs in one basket, you know, diversify, right? It's like buying one stock. That's, you know, silly. So when someone had heard him say that, he was like, why are you laughing? Because the person was laughing. Like, you're not supposed to do that. That's wrong. So Kobe's thinking in his mind, well, I'm going to put all my eggs that I have in one basket and I'm going to go get more eggs. So he was thinking in a different type of mentality. So they call it that mumba mentality, his type of mindset. When we look at his type of mindset, it was a very driven type of mindset. Do you see that same drive in the young athletes that you work with today? Or do you find that it's a little bit more nonchalant? That's a great question and a great quote and a great anecdote. I think it's indicative of the general population, right? There's a small percentage of the athlete that I see that is extremely driven. They are singularly focused on whatever it is they're trying to get to, right? And then the rest of the athletes are, they're driven to a point, but sport isn't the center of their universe and they're a little bit more realistic about it. I think the thing that I love about that quote, it's instructive from a sports psychology perspective is. I have no problem with any of my athletes putting all their eggs in one basket, as long as it's their basket and their, it's their eggs, right? If they want it internally motivated, right? If they're internally motivated to go get it and they're putting everything on the line, let's go get it. But if that basket is somebody else's basket or someone's filling that basket with their eggs and making them feel like they have to have that singular drive to get somewhere that can be really, really destructive, right? And so for me, motivation is such a big part of my work is to say, if you want this, if it's for you and you know the reasons why you want it, that's awesome. Go get it and I'll help you get it. A lot of athletes just don't know. They think they want it because somebody else wants it or they think they want it because they're supposed to want it and they're doing all this work. And it's like, well, I'm not really getting the payoff that I want or why am I doing all this work? I have other things that I, I enjoy in my life. Like, what's the point? I think those are the athletes I really, frankly, can help the most because they've got to sort out like, is this for me or is it for my parents or is it for my coach or is it for the social media world? I'm trying to prove something to somebody when I'm spending 20, 30, 40 hours a week on my sport. I'm not getting the results or feedback that I want and I'm still doing it. Like, what's the point, right? It's got to be for them. And I think that that's the trick in all of this. And I think a lot of times the adults in the equation ignore that and not willingly ignore it. They're just ignorant to it. Like, am I really clear about what my child or my athlete's motivation is for doing all this? Because otherwise they're going to burn out if they're not really into it. Looking at the second quote, and then we're going to dissect everything we spoke about today is talking about the idea that strong people get hurt too. But the difference between a strong person is that we rebuild silently. So we are going to rebuild quietly without the world even knowing that we got hurt. In our world, in our society, especially here in America, men are raised to keep their emotions inside or to deal with their emotions and to not express them openly and freely. Women, on the other hand, are more expressive. They're more supportive. And if we look at just the ratio of how many women coaches there are versus men coaches or how many men get coaching versus women get coaching, it's a large majority of women getting coaching before men or therapy before men. Because men are told that they have to deal with their own problems, that they can't rely on someone else. They have to do it themselves. Where do you think this mentality stem from? Where men feel like they can't be expressive, they have to internalize everything, and they have to handle their own business and deal with their own problems. I don't think it's entirely learned, but I think it's mostly learned. I think it's generational. I think it's passed on in society. And I think that the lack of male role models who are out there speaking up and talking about their struggles and talking about their feelings, like that's the permission, I think, a lot of times for young men to come forward and start to feel like it's okay. 
And I think that unfortunately is not universal yet. I mean, even the role models that we know athletically, right? Obviously they're advocates for mental health. They're advocates for, it's still a very, very masculine, for lack of a better word, macho world that we live in. And I think vulnerability is not something that most young men are comfortable with unless they're given a guide to understanding like it's okay to be vulnerable and being vulnerable actually is ammunition for success, for greater performance. Because if you humble yourself and you admit that I have a vulnerability and I need help, then all of a sudden you're giving somebody else the permission to come in and help you fix or deal with something that you've been trying to do on your own. So it's sort of like, it's like this, you know, strange, you know, paradox of like, actually, if you're vulnerable and you open up and say, I need help, you're going to get to where you want to go faster because you have more resources. You have people who are on your side supporting you. And I think that that's sort of the messaging we need to give the young people is like, Hey, let somebody in because they can help you. They can be your guide to get to where you want to go. I think of Michael Jordan when he got his coach, I, I believe his name is Tim Grover, and he was relying on Tim to help him in his blind spots because Michael was already a great player, but he just needed some fine tuning, whether it be his physical, his diet, and then his mental. And when he started working with Tim, he started to see the change in himself, but he still had that urge for victory. He's like, all right, I'm doing this and I'm not going to stop. I have someone now that's going to help me. And he is helping me. And his whole mentality started to shift. He started to be more laser focused. And it wasn't that he was using Tim as an outlet, like a therapist saying, hey, Tim, you know, like my life's so bad. Like I didn't win a ring this year or last year. It wasn't that. It was like, what do I need to work on? What do I need to do to improve so I can get those rings? And I think the conversation is different because I think sometimes when we look for help, we look for the fix. Tell me what I need to fix it. Tell me what I need to feel better. And here in the West, we are given this ideology of if there's something wrong with you, there's a quick fix for it. And sometimes there's not a quick fix, especially in sports when you're growing and you're becoming better. A coach is not a doctor who says, hey, you know, take these pills or these drugs and you're going to be number one. It's like we need to work on this and it's the building blocks that are going to make you a better player that's going to make you a better person in the end. And I think sometimes the ego can get in the way of our growth and our success because it stops us from opening up to the one person that can help us. We are taught at a young age to not speak up or to fit in with the crowd. So depending on what the world is doing or what my friend or my peer groups are doing, I need to replicate that. So if everyone is out doing weed or something like that, so they're doing drugs and they're like maybe going out and drinking and partying. Do I do that too, right? So they have that battle in their mind. Do I look for that pair acceptance or do I chase my dreams and my urge to be successful or to be this star player, whether it be basketball, football, soccer, whatever the sport be, they keep pushing themselves for that and they ignore all the outside stimulus that is so attractive and appealing to the brain because the brain wants acceptance. The brain wants to be comfortable. The brain wants camaraderie. And we have that tribe-like mindset instilled in us from generations. And it's difficult to get over that. What would you tell someone who is going to be going down the wrong path, maybe, that they are maybe going into a group of friends that might not be beneficial for their future? And you see that you're like, hey, you have so much talent. What is that conversation like when you're trying to show him the different paths without saying you need to be on this path and forcing him to be on it? Okay. So it's a great question and I love it. And it, it sort of really does get to the heart of my work, right? And so the way I present to any client, like if I put it into that sort of one-on-one -on -one context is, hey, this has to be your choice. You have to want to change. So if I say to an athlete, like to use your example, like I see them going down the wrong road, maybe associating with a group of people or they're not going to help them. I'll say, Hey, listen, if you do that, it's okay. That's your choice. Like, I'm not going to stop you from doing it. Now, here are the potential consequences of that. But if you know both sides of it and you understand that I'm going to do what I want to do because it makes me happy or comfortable or whatever, but just know that there's a consequence coming on the other side of this, right? Whether it's immediately or whether it's down the road, do you really want to regret the fact that you didn't achieve whatever goals you had for yourself by virtue of making that short-term choice that was comfortable or safe or fun? I have my own children and luckily they're not in harm's way. 
right now. So that example is probably extreme for them. I talk to them about that all the time. And one of the things that I struggle with as an adult and all adults struggle with is giving up control to the young person, letting them make their own choices, knowing that they could fall on their face. As a parent, I tell my kids, particularly my son is a little bit older. He's quite talented athletically, but he's a normal kid. He wants to do normal kid things. He wants to hang out with his friends. He wants to play video games, right? I said, listen, bud, I said, it's cool if you want to like do normal stuff, it's up to you. I'm like, but if you want to be a really good soccer player or a really good basketball player, you've got to do things differently than the other people. And you've got to invest more of your time. Don't be surprised when things don't work out your way. If you just want to be like everybody else, then it's up to me to step away and say, Hey, there's nothing I can do about that. It's got to be his choice. And I think that that push and pull between adult and young person, a lot of times the crux of every issue, right? Like, listen, you got to let them make their own choices to a certain extent. You give them the information, but if you force them to do anything, right? Forget about sports. If you try to force them to do anything against their will, they're probably going to take the other side and rebel just by virtue of saying like, you're not letting me live my life. That's a really hard thing for us to do as parents and coaches. But we also sometimes have to know that we don't control it either. They've got to want to change. They've got to want to be able to put in their work and they've got to want that goal. It's a very tricky dynamic because we want the best for our kids and we want to give them everything they need and we want to point them in the right direction. But after we point them in the right direction, do we give them the push from the back or do we let them figure it out for themselves? And that's, that's a really hard thing. I find that there's a difference between a coach and a parent and it's difficult when you're both. So you coach kids, so you know how it is. I was an educator. I was a swim coach for many years. What I learned in that time, you know, parents were coming to me. They know how to swim, right? So the parents could have taught their kid how to swim. And I remember I was talking to a father one day and he said, and he had three children that I was teaching how to swim. And he was like, when you get to that age and you have kids, you're going to notice that there's certain things that you can't teach your kids. You can tell them, but you can't teach them because it's different if mom or dad is saying it versus if a coach is saying it. You have a, like a sports psychology coach like yourself is saying it's a little bit different, right? Because if coach is saying it, I'm not going to be in the game. If I don't show up, I want to play, right? Because then they're in that mentality of that group. I want to be like everyone else that's playing, right? So that's a driver right there. It's difficult for parents to relinquish that power, I think, to coaches because you're basically giving your child to someone that might have different views than you. And now, especially now with the whole public school system and they're changing all these curriculum things and teachers are being very opinionated in how they teach subjects and different things, many parents are worried about their child's education. So a lot of parents are homeschool where parents are taking on that burden. Like, I want to teach my kid everything by myself when in reality, that is very unlikely that that's going to happen. I can see their good intentions. I do see that. I have a son and I want to teach him everything myself, but I am very aware that I can't teach him everything. There are certain things that I won't teach him. I know how to play several instruments. Will I teach him how to play all of them? No. If he wants some help and some guidance, sure, this is what you do. And he can figure it out. If he wants to play his sports, I'll probably put him on a sports team, right? And then if he's trying to you know, figure out how to be a better player, I was like, well, we're going to have to ask coach for that because I'm not going to be inserting or overstepping my bounds because coach has a different leverage than mom or dad has a different leverage. And I think that's important for parents to understand because it is a different dynamic. It's a different type of mentorship. And I find that the more mentors we give young children, the better they turn out. If they only have one, two, maybe three role models, they're going to base off their decisions off of those three role models versus they have a whole team of role models. You know, for football, it's a different coach, maybe for basketball or baseball, things like that. So there's different types of personalities, different types of mindsets, and there's going to be different players on the team. You're going to gravitate towards something from there. Oftentimes the brain gravitates toward negative, but hopefully, you know, in that situation, the coach is going to be developing a positive environment. So no matter which environment the child is trying to be in, they prefer to be there because it it makes them feel good, right? It makes them feel confident. It makes them feel strong. For a parent to understand that they can't do everything, I think is quintessential to a child's growth. Similar to how like there's different types of teachers where there's not a kindergarten teacher and that goes all the way up to eighth grade. The kindergarten teacher teaches kindergarten. There's another first grade teacher. And then we go up from there. What is your idea of education in the sense of having different coaches, having different mentors, having different positive mindsets to help guide these young athletes toward a better future? I would say generally, I agree with 
your statement of philosophy, right? Like, I think the more role models, positive role models that they have, there's a community of people around them that they can access, the better off they're going to be, right? In general, I totally agree with that. And what I find, I'll, I'll sort of limit it to my experiences. What I find is the families that come to me are the ones that recognize sooner rather than later that there's a limit to their ability to teach their kid everything. They give them all the resources. They give them the coaching. They give them the, you know, the training. They give them the guidance. They give them everything, right? Like everything they need. But they start to realize at a certain point, like as much as I want to give them the mental side of this or help them with the emotional side of this, there is a blind spot there. Part of the reason is it's like, I'll equate it back to my training as a sports psychology professional. You know, there's something ethically that we have to be aware of, which is multiple relationships. If I'm a parent and I'm a coach and I'm trying to coach, like I'm trying to do all these different roles, they blur, they conflict. Even though I'm trying to parent my child in the best way I know how as a sports parent, like at a certain point, like if I'm critical of my child or I'm trying to teach them something that I think they need to know, the parent part of that. The kid is saying like, well, you're my parent. You should just care about me. You should just love me. It should be unconditional. But now all of a sudden, the sport context is conditional. Well, you need to do this better. Why do I need to do this better? Well, in the kid's mind, it's like, well, you don't love me or you only care about how I perform. I'm not saying those are rational thoughts, but they're real thoughts because to your point, the brain goes to the negative. We're wired to protection, to survival. And if my parent is criticizing me about my sport performance, the first thing we think is like, what's wrong with me? And I think a lot of parents don't understand that. But the ones who do, the ones who realize they can't have that conversation with their kid anymore, and they realize that there is a blind spot or a gap. Those are the people that come to me and say, hey, listen, we're doing everything right for our kid. Our kid's doing everything right. There's just this missing piece and we need someone to bridge the gap. I feel privileged to serve in that role because it's such a big thing to help a young person to make sense of all these competing variables and all these competing feelings and all these competing thoughts and say, how do I develop my own point of view on it. how do I cope with it? How do I manage that? How do I develop a philosophy for the way I want to be as a person and a performer so that I can block out the noise? And I think that that's a lot in a lot of ways. That's what I do is to help them find their own perspective and their own personality. I'll share a story. I worked with a couple of young brothers. They're high school age athletes. They play soccer, highly talented soccer players. I serve them as a mental performance coach specifically related to sport. And they come from an, a very well-to-do, caring family, well-resourced. And one of these brothers is applying to go to a highly, highly prestigious college. Highly prestigious. Probably one of the five or 10 best colleges in the whole country. Right? Super academic, super smart kid. And the parents came to me. He was preparing for his interview with this college. And the parents came to me and said, can you help our son prepare for his interview? And that wasn't in a sport context. But it was the same idea of we're trying to help him prepare for this interview and he's not listening to us, but he'll listen to you because you're not his parent. When I helped him and I spent an hour and a half with him preparing for the interview, and it wasn't like we did go through the questions, right? But it was more about, hey, you need to develop a point of view about yourself. Pick a lane. Like This is who you are as a person. If you come through and say, this is who I am, these are my values, this is what I believe in, this is what I want then whatever happens, happens. It's out of your control. Rather than trying to be everything to everyone and try to please this interview or my parents, I'm going to be me and I'm going to pick that lane and I'm going to be confident in going through it. The same applies to sport, right? Like I'm going to be this. This is who I am as a person. All this other stuff, whether I play, whether I get recruited, whether my teammates like me, whether my parents are happy, like I don't control any of that. If I just identify for myself, like who I am and what I want, value-wise and what's important to me, what my goals and motivations are. And I just know that ultimately that's my North Star. Yeah, I'm going to veer off. We're human, right? We get upset. We make mistakes. We want people to like us. We want better results for ourselves. But if I always come back to that North Star of like, I control me. This is what I'm about as a person. And I'm going to go back to work. It's almost like the Michael Jordan example. He had Tim Grover to be his North Star. Like if I'm coming off track a little bit, I want someone to tell me I'm off track so I can get back on track. And that's important because a lot of times we just, we play to the result and we don't play to the process. We don't invest in the process and like really believe in who we are and trust that that's good enough. Because a lot of times athletes don't think it's good enough. They want more and they want more recognition and they want to please other people. That's really out of our control. 
I think it's extremely important for someone to understand their uniqueness just how they are versus how someone else is. Because it could have been easy for Kobe to say, I want to be like Michael, right? But he was in competition with Michael. He was like, I want to be better than I was. So he was always looking at that. But then the his North Star was, okay, I have something to shoot for, right? Michael, right? I want to beat him, right? So like that was his hunger. He was very competitive. But at the same time, he never lost respect for himself or for another player because he was always looking at himself. How can I make myself better? And then he became a leader. And in that whole sense of how can I make sure my team is better too, right? The team showed up too, where it wasn't just one player trying to do everything. Similar to how I think like LeBron and in the Cavs early on, where LeBron was trying to force everyone to say, hey, like, let's be strong, let's be great. And then he had to learn leadership. It's like, okay, well, let me be a leader and lead the team versus then trying to have the team keep up with me. I think this is a different type of mentality where we look at where we are, where other people are, understanding that they're on a different path, they're in a different place in life, and then going from there. Because just like that young boy that you were helping with the interview, he's in a different place. He had a different history. And he has to take ownership of that. Because if he is going to blame his parents for something or friends for something, in an interview, that looks bad because it's showing that that person is maybe immature to some degree, maybe can't take ownership or be expressive because what colleges are looking for, especially in young athletes, is who is this person going to become? Because it's not of who you are right now because you can get hurt and you can't play. But if your mentality is driven and there's nothing that's going to stop you, that's a different type of mentality. There's a story of Dan Millman. He was a gymnast, a Olympic gold medalist. I talk about this all the time where he had a very driven type of mentality. His ego was actually, I guess, maybe you can think of as harsh. So when people like dealt with him, they were like, oh, like, I don't really like this guy, right? But it wasn't until he opened up and learned about mindfulness, living in the moment, being at peace, understanding where he was, who he was, knowing his dreams, going after it, and then committing to it, regardless of any circumstance that he was given. And I'm sure you're familiar with the circumstance that he was given. It was a wall that he had to climb that Everyone else around him thought he would never climb, but he did it. He gave himself that mission, that goal, and he fortified himself. And I think what needs to be happening, especially in our young minds and our young athletes and our young adults, is that they have to fortify their mind to who they are and to who they're becoming. And they can't allow outside sources like the world, the parents, uh, you know, society, whatever, depict their future because they have to learn how to live life. And it's so important for them to continue to be unique and to continue to walk their path with the best of their abilities because they might not have the resources. If you grow up poor, right, maybe you can't afford a pair of sneakers and so you can't play soccer, you can't play basketball. So you're just playing on the local park or, you know, you're playing on the street if, you, if there's like a hoop around. You're using your resources, but then you have to understand how far do you want to go with that. I think a lot of young men, especially in those poor neighborhoods, are looking for a quick fix. I'm going to be an NBA star. I'm going to be a rapper. I'm going to be something that's going to change my whole life around. But when they start that process, they're confronted with a hurdle, a lot of work. There's a lot of work that needs to happen. And I think a lot of people don't understand that. I remember I was working with a young man. He was 16 at the time, and he said he wants to be the world's best soccer player. And I said, okay, well, great. That's not a problem. I said, well, what is your, you know, your favorite player? And he told me. And so I was like, okay, well, tell me his practice regimen. And so he was like, okay, cool. I said, triple it. He's like, okay. So the first week goes by. I say, tell me how the practice went. He's like, I didn't do any of it. And I was like, well, why? And then he went on to make excuses. I was like, but you told me you wanted to be the world's best. You won't even try your favorite player's practice regiment for a week. What does that show you? Are you driven for this? Do you really want this? Or are you looking for the easy out? He eventually changed his career or his path. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's just an awakening. Figure out what you want and then understand that if it's not for you, not a big deal. You can pivot. Yeah. Figure out what you want and why you want it, right? Like I'll go back to the interview example. The first thing I said is like, why do you want to go to this school? Do you want to go to this school so you can tell somebody you go to this school? Do you want to go to the school so you can make a lot of money at a job you don't even know what that job is? Do you want to go to the school because your parents want you to go? Or do you want to go to the school because it means something to you, right? I'm going to be able to use this as a stepping stone to get to somewhere that's really important because 
Now you're going to make a sacrifice of going to an academic institution where you're going to have to spend tens of hours every week just keeping up. Do you really want that? If you really want that and you know why you want that, then that's great. But in that case, right, it's like, I want to be the world's greatest soccer player. Why? So I can make a lot of money and people like me on social media. That's not sustainable, right? So I'll go back to the actually when you were talking about the Kobe example. It's really important to point this out too. The highest performers, the most elite people are high in internal motivation and they're high in ego. So what do I mean? It means they want to be the best relative to everybody else, but they also have that internal motivation to do all the work necessary to achieve that. So there's a sort of super high bar for them on both fronts. I think a lot of times it's either I'm highly internally motivated and I just love the process, but I have a low ego. That's in some ways just a hobby. Sometimes there's super high ego motivation. Like I want people to notice me and I want to be on social media and I want to be better than so-and-so. But they, in your example, they don't want to do anything about it because it's the only thing that matters is the outcome, but they're not doing it for any particular purpose other than that. And like all of a sudden you're going, well, it seems unrealistic. So I'm just not going to do anything, which just sounds like what happened. And then you just move on. Right. And that's okay too. Right. Like you said it, it's okay. Part of my job is helping athletes realize that, right? Like, why do you want this? And if you don't want this for the right reasons, or you really don't want it for yourself, then why are you doing it, right? Why are you doing it? It's okay if you don't want to do it. Those are the things parents won't say, or parents have a really hard time with. It's okay if you walk away because, and I'm the same way, right? You've invested so much in this process from the time you're five years old, a lot of the time until you're 18, 22 years old, you've invested time, money, energy. If you walk away, are you foregoing some potential actualization, right? But at the same time, that young person, to your point, needs to own that and say like, do I really want this? And if I don't, it's okay to walk away because I don't really want it other than to please other people. That's a very slippery slope, tricky, tricky balance. So then when you have somebody like a coach who comes in and normalizes that or gives some perspective to it, it makes it a little bit easier because otherwise it's just you and your parents or you and your coach. Now you've only got two points of view. When you get someone in who has the dissenting opinion, it says, no, it's okay if you walk away, as long as you're walking away for the right reasons. And I think that that's really hard to to decipher sometimes, especially when we're in our own head. And just to add to the walk away part, the walk away part is not that you're quitting. The walk away part is going to be understanding that you understand that this is not what you're in alignment with. So you're trying to find your purpose and this might not be your purpose and you're okay with that, but you're going to use all of that experiences that you gained, the wisdoms that you gained from your coaches, from your teammates, and you're going to use that as a stepping stone, as a foundation for whatever is next in your life. Because I believe that what we learn is going to be sequential to who we are, who we grow to. Because if we just say, okay, well, I'm going to be an engineer. And then, you know, the next day you're an engineer. You didn't have any building blocks to be an engineer or to you don't have the education to be an engineer. You learn many different things in sports, especially sports. You learn how to be good teammates. You learn leadership. You learn the idea of pushing yourself because if you've ever been running out of field, track, wherever, it's a lot of work. It's strenuous on the brain and the brain is telling you to give up, give up, give up. But you don't give up, right? Because you're not just doing it for yourself. You're doing it for your team too. So you overcome your brain's initial spark to saying, hey, give up, dummy. Like you're about to have a heart attack. No, you're not. You're just getting your adrenaline going, your blood's pumping. It's hard for the body or the brain to understand the difference between if they're in danger or if they're not in danger. If you're on the court and you're running around, the brain's saying like, it's the reason why you, like your heart's going like this. You're probably in danger, but you're not, right? You're safe. So you learn about mindset there. And I think that's one of the best things that we can learn in sports is that we learn our limits and then we surpass them every single day. I love that. And I th- and it brings to mind an example of an athlete that is my client. She is a division one track athlete. She runs sprints. I've never been a track athlete. I've never run a 200 meter dash or a 400 meter dash, but by all accounts, it is extremely painful. We've sort of worked through this together of this idea of like, why are you still doing track? And she went in the COVID period and, you know, she hasn't gotten the results that she wanted. When I first started working with, she was questioning like, why do I, why am I doing this? Like I put in all this effort. It's really, really hard. I feel a lot of pain, all this stuff. And we sort of sorted through it. 
ultimately she came to the conclusion. I love being part of a team. I love competing. I love running, but at the margin, right? The way you were describing it, like for her, it's like overcoming the mental block of, do I push through that last 50 meters or 25 meters to really feel that like burning, like almost like I'm going to die pain. Like, why am I doing that? And I think that's sort of where I come in a lot of the times is to say like, Hey, the reason why you're doing it is this. If you can find a way to convince your brain, what it wants to tell you is you're dying, like to your point, right? Survival instinct. If we can come up with these mental strategies to overcome that, now all of a sudden you're starting to get the results that are fueling that desire to continue, right? Because there needs to be, a lot of times there needs to be a result like relative to other people, right? Am I winning a race? Is my time improving? Am I meddling? If you're not getting that, it is easy to be like, well, you know what? Screw it. I'm not going to push the last 50 meters. I'm just going to finish and I'm going to finish three seconds behind and that's okay. But if you really want to win, you got to tell yourself like, there's a reason why I'm going to push myself to the point where I think I'm going to die because I need to, to get the results that will continue to allow me to keep that motivation to keep going. The brain, you've highlighted it better than I have, but the brain is such an enemy at a lot of times in terms of performance. Our brain is so wired for protecting and survival. Our brain blows everything out of proportion. Any sort of pain, any sort of discomfort, any sort of threat is going to be perceived as almost life-ending. And we have to convince ourselves that, hey, the brain is just doing what it does, but we have the ability to overcome that and manage it and talk back to it to say, hey, I got this. It's just trying to scare me, but it's not going to scare me because I know better. 99% of the population doesn't even realize that. Forget about sports, right? Like in our jobs, parenting, right? We always assume the worst case scenario, like something's going to blow up and this is really going to be terrible. And in most cases, nothing terrible happens, but we tell ourselves it's going to happen so that we can protect ourselves from it. But that limits our ability to live up to our potential in whatever we do. And the work you do is more than just helping young athletes. It's paving the way for children, teens, young adults to understand that they can go after the things that they have in their mind. It's not so much of, you know, what coach says or the teacher says or mom or dad says. It's about what they say, right? And to be open and to be free to make those choices. And if you want something, you're going to be that facilitator to help them, to guide them. And I think it's so important to have a guidepost or to have someone helping you or believe in you, even that. Because it's easy for naysayers to say that you can't do something. Roger Bannister, another person, everyone said that he couldn't run the sub four minute mile and he tried and tried again, regardless of what science says. Scientists said, if you do this, your heart's going to explode. But he ignored all the naysayers. And as soon as he did it, everyone else followed. There's going to be limits in our life that are placed on us. And we have the ability to shatter those limits. We have the ability to be more than what we are, than what the standards are today, we can choose to be more. And the work that you do, Mike, is just a start to, to helping these young athletes understand that their mindset can be more. It will help them and not just sports in all the aspects of their life, your relationships, your careers, all of that is going to be affected by the work that you're doing, just setting that foundation that they can choose what they want for themselves, that they can be more, that they don't have to settle for less. So if I can from you, Mike, can I get any last words and then please share how the audience can find you? That was well said. And I really appreciate that there are people like you in the world who understand that and are talking about it openly. What I'll say is this, I'll take it from a place of personal experience. I wasn't always the greatest athlete. I've been through a lot of challenges in my life personally in the last 47 years that allowed me to get to this place where I actually have the privilege of coaching young people and working with families. Like this is my second career. And so if I use that as an example, as sort of something that's guiding is it's never too late to do what it is that you want to do. For me, it wasn't until I developed the purpose in life of helping others through this career that I got there. And I think that that's instructive for young people. Like if you believe in something and you have a purpose and you have values, follow those values, right? Rather than chasing the result of, I want to make money. I want people to recognize me. I want my, like, no, you can do it. You got to want it and you got to have that experience. And it does translate to all areas of life. And I think that it's really important for people to understand that. So I try to speak not only from a place of professional authority, because I have expertise and I have certifications and all those things, 
but because from my own personal experiences, like you've got to really want it. And if you want it, go get it. And I want to be a guide in that. You know, it's really important to me to have that opportunity to help people get to where they want to go. Uh, that's why I do what I do. And so if you want to learn more about me or that, you can go to my website. Everything is sort of about me is there. It's Michael V as in Vincent Huber, H-U-B-E-R.com. And I have blog posts. I have my own podcast. There's a lot of information about me. There's a bunch of free stuff there. So pretty much anything you want to learn about me, you could find there. It's sort of a good starting point. Perfect. And I encourage everyone to check you out. The conversation we have is just the start today of your children, your teens, your young adults, because I know many parents and actually I can't even think of a parent who doesn't put their kids in some type of sport. It's going to be beneficial to understand what a sports psychologist coach can do to help your child grow mentally and all the aspects of their sport and then later in their life. It's so important. And I want to thank you, Mike, for coming on and spending a little bit of time and sharing your expertise and wisdom. Thanks for having me. It was a great conversation. I really appreciate it. Michael Huber, everyone. All right, everyone. I'd like to thank Michael Huber for coming on Coaching In Session. It was a great pleasure to have him on speaking about the work he does. And you can see he's very passionate about what he does and the work he does. And I can relate to him, especially when it comes to being a parent. And then if you're going to be that coach, there's that condition that has to be there now. And I talked about this with one of my other guests about how men are unable to be unconditional lovers to their children. It's not that men can't be unconditional lovers to their children. It's just that men oftentimes give their children conditions. So moms or women might not do that often, maybe sometimes, but oftentimes men are going to say, if you want to get my love, you have to be this, you have to be that. And it's not accepting them for who they are. And even if it's difficult for the parent, that parent has to go through a phase or a time where they really have to do some investigation internally to figure out, is this really my say? And sometimes it's not, right? Sometimes if the kid wants to go off and be an actor and you don't want them to be a lawyer or if you want them to be an NFL player and they want to be a soccer player, it's their choice. That's their life. We really can dictate what they do. Now, of course, we might say my house, my rules, but then at the same time, once they grow up and they're able to leave the nest, they're going to disown the parent because mom or dad didn't give them the freedom that they wanted. And I think oftentimes the reason why many parents today end up in nursing homes is that children are not taught the idea of family, right? It's always, I will accept you if you get good grades. I will accept you if you're good in sports. I will accept you if you do this or that but I won't accept you if that is this. And it's difficult for that child to later on understand the value of family because they were always given a strict guideline that they had to follow. And it's difficult for that child to, again, open up, be emotional with their parents because they were always told that they had to do something. They always had to show up. And subconsciously, that child didn't want to displease them. Maybe later on, now they're living a life that they're not happy with. When in reality, we don't have to choose that unhappiness. It might be a good marker for us to understand, well, we don't like this, but it doesn't necessarily mean that we have to follow what we don't like anymore, especially when we're older. I think people sometimes feel like they're stuck or their circumstances dictated what their life is going to be, when in reality, they always can go a different direction. And it's important for them to understand that because if they're going to be thinking that they have to keep doing this because someone else said so, they're always going to be thinking that in their life. They're always going to be thinking because someone else said so. Well, what do you say? What do you want in your life? And the work that Mike does in sports psychology is telling these young minds, especially these young athletes, what do you want to do? What do you want to accomplish? How can I help you? What do you need from me? And that's so important to have someone believe in you, to be a resource to someone, to be a guide and a mentor for someone. Because when we don't have that positive figure in our life, we are going to Put something else there. It could be a negative figure. It could be a negative idea, a negative ego that's going to stop us or cause harm in our life. And there's going to be many moments in our life where we're going to want to quit. There's going to be many moments in our life where we're going to doubt ourselves or we're going to feel insecure. But those moments are the best moments because they're going to really pronounce our mindset. They're going to help us define what we are, who we are, who we will be, and how we do it. Because if you know anything about mindset, there's no limits to it. The limit is you. So how can you learn to become limitless in the sense of your mind, the psychology of how you think? 
you have to understand it first. My name is Michael Reardon. I'm a mindset coach. If you have any questions, you can email me, coachingincession at gmail.com. And I will see everyone on the next episode of Coaching in Session. Until then, everyone, take care.